That's Psalm 19. Here we go. For the choir director, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to their other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. So I want to start by telling you about two uh, moments. Uh, The first, they both have to do with my sons. The first one is with Levi. So when he was really little and he was our only kid, uh, every night we would have dinner and then Levi and I would go out to the front yard and we'd look up at the sky and see if we can find the moon. Now, besides just being a beautiful moment with my son, I was often just in awe of how beautiful the night sky is. Do you ever have those moments where you just look and just go, wow, that's beautiful? The, the other one is with Jonah. One day he and I got up super early to drive to Newcastle. It was really dark. And as we were coming over the plains, coming into Corindai, the sun was beginning to rise. And as it was rising, the colours as they changed, purples to pinks to oranges, yellows, and then to that blue as the sun is fully up, It was just amazing, absolutely beautiful, just glorious. Do you have have those moments where you look and you just go, wow, how beautiful, isn't it glorious? I mean, it's clearly not made by mistake. Someone had to make that, and the one who did must be so powerful and creative. Well, that's where our psalm starts today, but it's not where it ends. Because as we'll see, we can partially know God's glory by looking at his creation, but we more fully know him by listening to his word. And by knowing him through his word, we will know ourselves and our true nature, which will demand a response. Pray with me now. Lord, thank you so much for revealing yourself to us in your word. As we come to look at Psalm 19 today, help us to see it for what it really is, your perfect word that testifies to who you are. Please open our eyes to the radiance of your word, and may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Uh, We're at point two. Uh, Over the holiday break, we're working through some psalms, as Tim pointed out. Today, Psalm 19, uh, 34 with Andrew next week, 38 with Phil the following week. And so we're in Psalms, the Psalter, and it's really quite an amazing book. It's full of poems or songs. Uh, Many were written by David, but uh, others as well. 
Uh, they're, they're all essentially prayers as well, responses to God for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And in that, it's quite different to the rest of the Bible. Uh, we know from 2 Timothy that all scripture is God-breathed. But here we have God giving us his word as words for us to use in response to him. But how can we do that? I mean, I... Oh, this psalm was written by David, yeah, um, at a particular time reflecting his experiences. I'm not David. I'm not a king or a shepherd. I don't live in ancient Israel. Uh, how, how am I to pray this psalm? Well, to do that, we need to read it uh, in a way that centres on Christ. After all, it's the spirit of Christ that breathed it out. Now, there's a, a great pair of books by Christopher Ash uh, on the Psalms, and in one of these books it says, If the Gospels give us Christ's deeds and words, the Psalms open a window into his heart. So this is how we're going to attack the Psalm today. First, we're going to look at it in its original context. What did it mean for the original author and readers? Then we're going to look at how Jesus himself fulfills the Psalm how he is the psalm. And then we'll look at how we can sing or pray this psalm as members of the body of Christ. Which brings us to point three, looking at the original context. And we get our first hint at that at the little subscript. This is the little italics bit that's next to the bold number there. Technically, this is verse one and needs to be read as it's just as much God's word as the rest of the psalm. These subscripts often give us a bit of information, the author, who it's for, maybe the situation that it's been written in, or sometimes even the tune that you would sing it to. In this instance, the psalm was written for the choir director. I don't know how many of you experienced choirs before, but choirs is a big group of people singing together. So this psalm is written by David, God's anointed king, to sing for, for God's people to sing together. Yes, there's moments of individual response in there, but it's for individuals within the community of God's people together. So there's a bit of our context. Let's get into the content. We're at sub point 3A, creation declares the glory of God. David in verses 1, 2 and 4 gets straight into expressing how the heavens declare the glory of God. Look at the communication language in there. The heavens declare, the expanse proclaims, they pour out speech, they communicate knowledge. The sky and all its inhabitants communicate God's goodness, his glory. It reveals that there is a God and that he is powerful. After all, this is the works of his hands. It shows that he's not hidden and there is order to it. Look at how the sun is described in verses 4 to 6. God has pitched a tent for the sun. God has. He put it there. He made it to shine down on the earth, to give light and to give warmth. And it has a cycle that God has put in place. I mean, the images of the bridegroom and the athlete in there really draw out that intentional order of God's creation. The creation tells of God's glory. Glory meaning the outwardly visible expression of God's inward being, that what God is, God shows. But there's a problem. Have a look at verse 3. It says, there is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. No words, no speech, no voice. There's enough there to know there is a God who has created and sustains his creation, but we don't know him. If you want more, look at Romans 1, 18 to 20 for more on that. But the issue with this general revelation here is that you don't get to know who he is more fully. Just a general understanding. Special revelation, on the other hand, is how God reveals himself to us in the Bible and in the person of Jesus Christ. Has anyone seen the movie Singing in the Rain? Raise your hands if you've seen Singing in the Rain. 
All right, if your hand's not up, homework this week. Watch Singing in the Rain. It's a great movie musical. It's about a film company back in the time when films were changing from silent films to talkies. The two main characters, well, there's a few main characters, but the main characters are actors in movies. Uh, but because they're silent films, though, all of their intent is expressed through their physicality. There's no words, there's no speaking. Uh, one of them is the actress. She is quite beautiful, uh, demonstrates great grace in the way that she uh, performs. But then they start to make talking films, films with sound, films with speaking. And this causes a big problem because to hear this actress speak, to hear her words is to discover her true nature. She has a high nasally voice. She's quite dim-witted, and if we were to use an Australian term, she is a bogan, okay? Her words, her speech, reveal who she really is, which leads me on to the next point. If her words and her speech reveal who she is in a negative way, much to the shock of the audience, similarly, the next part of our psalm here reveals in a positive way who God is, because his word expresses his will. Point B, I use that metaphor of the actress from Singing the Rain to demonstrate the importance of words in communication for revelation. It is true of God. Yes, the skies show his glory and his power, but they have no words. It is through his word, the law, the scriptures, that he expresses his will and reveals his true nature. In verses 7 to 11, David draws out the preciousness of God's word. He uses six titles for it, instruction and testimony in verse 7, precepts and commands in verse 8, fear and ordinances in verse 9. It's also something interesting I've noted this week is the progression of the titles that David uses for God. In verse 1, He's called God. In verse 7, David calls him the Lord. And you'll see that's all in capitals, meaning Yahweh, the personal covenantal name for God. Now, this personal name goes hand in hand with his personal revelation through his word to his people. David, through this section, points out nine qualities of God's word because it's clear to David There's definite value in God's word. Things like it's perfect, it's trustworthy, it's right, it's radiant, it's pure, it's enduring, it's reliable, it's righteous, and it's precious. And with these qualities, there are results for his people, for those who feed on his word. These results being the renewing of one's life, making the inexperienced wise, making the heart glad, making the eyes light up, Aren't these great things? But I want to come back to one of the word titles for God's word used by David that sort of stands out. It's a bit different. Can anyone pick which of those six is the one that's a bit different? It's in verse 9. Fear, the fear of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but this is not a typical word I would use for word communication. But there it is. It's included amongst all these other word-based instructions. The fear of the Lord, which means the paying of reverence, a recognition for who he really is, his weightiness as the most powerful being in the universe. It's there as if to say the fear of the Lord is embedded in his word. True reverence for God is found in his perfect instruction, his trustworthy testimony, because that's where we get our understanding of who he really is. You can look at creation and know the significance of God, but you won't fear God from that. You only truly fear God with reverence he deserves when you read his word. And because his word is perfect and trustworthy, that fear will be pure without fault. The fear of the Lord means to know him more fully. And in doing so, we will then have our sinful nature confronted because his word reveals our nature, 
Have a look at verse 11, this nice little transition verse. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. There is a warning in God's word for those who read it. That warning is about our fallen and broken nature. It reveals the human position before God as sinful beings who are in need. In verses 12 and 13, David points out four categories of sin, unintentional sins, hidden faults, willful sin, and blatant rebellion. These are the same categories used in the book of Leviticus. David is drawing his readers, those who are singing together, to respond to God's perfect word with repentance. Look at the repentant language used. Cleanse me. Keep your servant. Do not let them rule me. I will be blameless. His is a prayer of repentance, a seeking for the Lord out of his goodness to forgive their sinful state and to make them clean. And this prayer finishes with acknowledgement of the fact that God does change people. Have a look at verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Who can make them right? God, their rock, their redeemer. It is interesting that David speaks of the words of my mouth. Doesn't that resonate with the beginning of the psalm? The creation speaks of God's glory and God's word is perfect, blameless, trustworthy. This final prayer is a desire to be in line with God, to be perfect as his God is perfect. So what about Jesus then? How does he fit in? Well, let's go back through this psalm with the Jesus lenses on now. Remember verses 1 to 6. They talk of how creation proclaims God's glory. But hold on a minute. Who created all that in the first place? Well, let's have a look at Colossians 1, verse 15 to 17. Here it is. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. The he in this passage is Jesus. Everything was created by him, through him, and for him. So the heavens declare the glory of God. These were made by Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus. They declare his glory. Not only that, Jesus himself is the radiance of God. He expresses God's glory perfectly. The creation is not the image of God. Jesus is the image of God and has dominion over the creation. So demonstrates that glory to its complete fulfillment. But wait, there's more. Now remember our reading from John chapter 1. How is Jesus described? As the word. Thank you. Just checking you're awake. Um, He is the complete special revelation of God. In Psalm 19, where was the special revelation of God? In God's word. John describes Jesus in verse 14 as the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the complete fulfillment of God's word. So I want to do this. I'm going to go back to Psalm 19, verses 7 to 10. I'm going to swap out all the word-based instructions for Jesus. Jesus is perfect, renewing one's life. Jesus is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. Jesus is right, making the heart glad. Jesus is radiant, making the eyes light up. Jesus is pure, enduring forever. Jesus is reliable and altogether righteous. He is more desirable than gold than an abundance of pure gold and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. Can you see it? Jesus is the complete, perfect fulfillment of God's word. Not only that, but he lived this out too. He perfectly listened to God's instructions and obeyed them. He perfectly feared the Lord. He perfectly fed on the sweetness 
That is the scriptures. You want an example? Look to his temptation by the devil in the desert. I mean, he quoted scripture. He trusted the Father. He obeyed. He revered God more than what the devil offered. So now I bet you're thinking, okay, so Jesus is verses 1 to 6 and he's verses 7 to 10. What about the rest? How can Jesus be verses 12 and 13? Wasn't Jesus perfect without sin? Have a look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God made Jesus sin for us. Jesus becomes that sin so that we can be changed. We can be made righteous. We can be made blameless and cleansed from our blatant rebellion. So Jesus enables verses 12 to 13 for us. He is the rock and the redeemer that we can cry out to, to whom we can pray, make the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. He has enabled us to be able to sing this psalm as part of the body of Christ, the people of God. So how will we do that? Well, there's four things that we can take away from this psalm, knowing that Jesus is the fulfilment of it and that he has enabled us to sing it. First, we need to understand the creation correctly. Yes, appreciate it, enjoy it, admire its beauty. But remember, that's where it ends. The creation is not God. It is only a general revelation of God's glory. God is God and Jesus is the one who truly reflects God's glory. So as you marvel at the sky, yes, admire it, but let it remind you of the one who put it in place. Remember, it has no speech. There's no words. It points to the greatness that is our rock and redeemer. Second, Only God's word reveals God and his nature. Remember, the heavens declare his glory, but it's it's in his word that we discover his true nature and character, where his will is revealed, where we learn about his great love and his plan for this world. So when we sing the psalm, it will remind us of the importance and value of meeting with God in the scriptures to get to know his perfect nature better. Which naturally then leads us on to the third point. The word of God will help us understand our own nature correctly. Knowing God through his word, that he is perfect, trustworthy, radiant, we will then know that we clearly are not. We are lost in unintentional and intentional sins. The faults that we try to hide and our blatant rebellion. If we spend time going through the scriptures, we see over and over again how humanity has fallen short of the glory of God. We'll know that we need cleansing. We'll know that we need saving. We will know we need someone to make us blameless because on our own, we can't do it. As you read through God's word, are you hearing that message? Because God's word isn't meant for information but for transformation, which brings us on to the fourth point, that our nature is changed and renewed. If we recognise what our true nature is, then our response should be like David in this psalm. We'll cry out to God in repentance. We'll ask to be cleansed. And through the blood of Jesus, we will be made new. Now that brings with it so many great and wonderful things. We saw that in verses 7 to 11. Remember all those positive outcomes. Well, that becomes true for us. A renewed life, inexperienced wise, heart made glad, the eyes light up. How great is that? Considering all that, I want to finish by asking you a question. As you encounter Jesus, as you read through the scriptures, does it make your heart glad? Does it make your eyes light up? Our emotions can get stirred over all sorts of things, beautiful sunrises, star-filled sky, or even things like an exciting football match or a tasty meal or we have a bumper crop or, for me, 
listening to a song that's got a great chord progression in it. But what about reading the Bible? Does it stir your emotions? If not, why not? Because there's nothing wrong with it. It says in verse 7, it's perfect. Friends, I pray that you'll find joy reading the Bible, getting into God's Word. I mean, preparing this sermon today has got me really excited. Every time I've read it, there's something new. If you aren't regularly engaging with God through His Word, can I encourage you, get reading. There's a reason David describes it as more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. It will confront you. It will stretch you and ultimately will bring you into a more personal relationship with the true and living God. It will change you, both your heart and your mouth, your proclamation and your practice. Jesus made it possible for you to have access, to understand, to mine its riches. Remember, the fear of the Lord is pure, and that will only come from engaging with Jesus in his holy scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your instructions, for your testimony, for your precepts, for your commands, for your ordinances. Please grow in us a reverential fear for you. Please grow in us a desire to meet with you more in your scriptures. Please grow our joy as we do. Thank you so much for Jesus for making that possible for us. Amen.